how's it going everybody this is the nitty gritty my name is chad with me as always is leonard and we are back at you this week for another edition of our spotlight series where we will cover some of the lesser known wrestlers from our past that you may not know a lot about and go into detail about their career or specifically one of the characters that they portrayed and tonight i think we're going to be covering two one one basically but but there's gonna be another guy coming up right so yeah we are going to be talking this week about corporal kirshner and mainly talking about his wwf run but he had a run elsewhere as well so let's get into it we always have a certain format we go with some with these shows so let's start with his early years and he was born in chicago illinois his birth name is michael penzel but uh, his name is mike kirshner and like i said he was born in chicago illinois and from there as a teenager, he enlisted in the United States Army. He became a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division, and he left the Army in his early 20s. Um, and he talked about how he joined the Army in a post-Vietnam period, and a lot of the instructors took it very seriously. From there, he went on to work as a mechanic and a bouncer in Minnesota, and it was there that he met Hulk Hogan in a gym. And Hogan introduced Kirshner to the American Wrestling Association promoter Vern Gagne. That's where Hogan was at the time. And he helped him enroll in a professional wrestling school operated by Vern Gagne. So from there, he would work as a pre preliminary wrestler for the World Wrestling Federation under the name R.T. Reynolds. And from there, he was act obviously given a character a mainstream character in the WWF, which we'll get to. But before we get to his main years, let's just talk about how you know of him, Leonard, because I will tell you the only way, until we started doing this show, or unless I heard his name on documentaries or in podcasts, the only way I knew who this was, was because of his LJN figure. That was it. I had this LJN figure and I was like, Corporal Kirshner. Okay. I, I don't know if I ever saw any of his matches, if I ever paid attention to any of his matches, but he was a figure that I had. And, you know, as a kid, you just want a figure to have, you know, your hero beat up on. So like, that was just kind of all right. And it's funny to me, looking back at some of these LJN figures, some of these obscure ones, some of these guys that were only there for a little bit, yet they were able to get these figures that are so revered and sought after and memorable to people like us who grew up in the 80s watching this. Um, and he didn't have a very long stint in WWF, but he has that figure, which is always out there, right? Yeah. Didn't, didn't How Bad Jack also have an LJN figure? He did. Who we covered on the Spotlight series. Yeah. Um, you, Corporal Kirshner is the figure you get when your grandma gets you a wrestling figure for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. Hey, grandma, I want wrestling figures for Christmas. Okay, I'll get you one. Wait, get I Corporal wanted Hogan Kirshner. with the white shirt. Uh, no, oh, no, <laughs> you just you just get the one she did. And of course, you get Corporal Kirshner because there's a bunch of those on the shelf. Right. That's what they call a peg warmer in the in the uh, toy toy biz. Um, you know, this was a uh, suggested to me by my friend Ronnie, which. I think I say at the beginning of every episode. And hey, we uh, so appreciate every suggestion he's given and uh, they are, they are much appreciated and yes. uh, it's, it's, it makes the show a lot of fun. So he is our number one fan and, and, and we love him for it. And we, and we're glad he's watching. I thank you, Ronnie. Uh, and he always, after he watches the episode, he usually texts me like a few ideas on, on, Oh, Hey, here's what I thought about it and all that. But anyway, I mentioned, I mentioned this came from him because of all the people we've covered so far in the Spotlight series, this is the first one that I really have no memory of. You know, I've heard the name like you. It popped up here and there, different documentaries and, and reading different show reviews and things like that. But I couldn't tell you what he looked like or any matches he had or feuds he had. 
And to me, that's funny because, and we'll get into this, but his most high profile match was probably a flag match yep. at WrestleMania two against uh, Nikolai Volkov, which is a show that I've watched several times because I had it on VHS back in the day. I had the first three on, v- on VHS. So the fact that I watched that show and I do not remember that match and I do not remember him uh, might just speak to how memorable he was which is not much at all well um, you know what i let me interject one thing yeah and, and and this is not to say that he's like the most memorable character ever but i would also i would argue that wrestlemania 2 is one of the least memorable wrestlemanias that there is now that doesn't mean yeah. it's the worst that doesn't mean it's the worst no no in terms of memorable matches that to me is very near the bottom like if i was rating worst i'd be talking about wrestlemania 9 right now but I remember a lot of the matches on that show, even though they were bad. Yeah. <laughs> like WrestleMania two, there's so much on there that I'm like, oh man, that was on there. Yeah, that was on there too. <laughs> well, when we when we get to WrestleMania season, and if we do the wrestling rebook idea, we, we should do WrestleMania one and two certainly, really? uh, because I have a lot of thoughts on that as well. But that's a different show. That's not what we're talking <laughs> about today. Uh, but yeah, you know, and that, and that's not me saying anything against against Kirshner himself. Uh, you know, an interesting thing here is the fact that he was uh, an army in the Army Airborne, and we also did Ranger Ross for the Spotlight series, who was a real life Army Ranger and and played one that was his character. So I think it, it's an easy gimmick for a real life soldier to have, and I don't mean that you know derogatorily. Um, it's just like they've got the street cred to carry it on, you know. He knows what a soldier looks like. He knows how he acts. He knows how he moves. Um, you know, if anything's ever said, you know, by real soldiers, hey, he's got that background. Um, and uh, but to say, if, if you gave me a choice of, hey, you want to watch some Ranger Ross matches, you want to watch some Corporal Kirshner matches, I would probably go with Ranger Ross, both of whom we've covered here in the Spotlight series now. Really? And, and, yeah, I would probably go with Ranger Ross over Corporal Kirshner if you said, just who do you want to watch matches of? Uh, that, that that's who I would go with. Uh, but 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 let's get into the next part where where we talk about some of those matches in that WWE run because there's at least there's one promo I definitely want to talk about and I don't want to jump the gun on that. Right. Well, yeah. Let's let's talk about his his spotlight years here. Um, as I said, eventually he was given a character as a military hero in the WWF, and Vince uh, once Vince discovers what your background is. That is how he usually assigns characters. That's uh, why Undertaker recently had talked about in his first interview with Vince had talked about how he sang in the shower and then immediately regretted it. He's like, wait, no, because he didn't want to be a character that sang in the shower or sings in the ring. So, Mm -hmm. you know, that's how Vince did it. And so combine the fact that this guy has a military background with the fact that Sergeant Slaughter had recently left the company after a disagreement about the G.I. Joe figure. And if you watch any AWA footage from with Sergeant Slaughter around this period, you will see a G.I. Joe logo on his outfit because AWA was more than willing to deal with that. And so unfortunately yeah. for somebody like Mike Kirshner, he's brought in and is looked at as kind of this, you know, probably by fan, most fans is this poor man, Sergeant Slaughter, and it, you know, by that, rank, a corporal is under a sergeant. That's to mention. That's right. Yeah, he should have demanded that he be like Commander Kirshner or something of like that. Yeah, Colonel yeah. Kirshner, and I believe actually he was Colonel Kirshner for a little bit when he went back to AWA. But uh, yes, um, so yes, he was given. He had several vignettes uh, showing him doing uh, army survival training exercises in order to build him as this patriotic American. Um, we'll get into some of his feuds when we cover his notable matches. Um, he had a, a segment on the body shop with Jesse Ventura that you can find on the network and where he, you know, he, like there was a lot, there's a lot of footage on the network where he talks about his time in the military and he does these various training exercises. So mm-hmm. he was on WWF's Australian tour in mid 1986. Um, it was the first Australian tour under Vince McMahon's ownership at the time. And he was considered one of the toughest guys in the company at that time. But he was also apparently considered one of the stiffest people in the company at that time. And so what it's written is that some people were reluctant to work with him is because of this. 
And eventually, as we talk about many times in the Spotlight series, people towards the end of their run become used as enhancement talent. Uh, so he was eventually suspended by the WWF for testing positive for drugs in 1987. And it's worth noting um, in a different article that I found on WWE's website, he was also going through a really messy divorce at this time. Um, so when his suspension ended in 87, he just declined to return and he left the company. So Kirshner left WWF uh, and went to uh, Heart, uh, the Hart Stampede Wrestling promotion in Canada for a little bit, where he was known as Colonel Kirshner. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's in terms of his spotlight years, that's pretty much all she wrote. So yeah. Do you have, Leonard, any comments on his spotlight years before we get to some of his matches? Yeah, well, you the, the body shop is the promo I wanted to talk about. Um, one, it, I, just, I think it's the best promo of his that I watched. Uh, yeah. He comes off usually very stiff and kind of awkward in promos where he doesn't know exactly what to say or he's only got about 30 seconds worth of material and then the mic is still there and he goes, oh, right. you know, what am I going to say now? Uh, uh, but uh, the body shop promo I thought was very good, and this was hyping the the flag match at WrestleMania two with Koloff, and uh, or Volkov I said Koloff, different Russians, <laughs> Nikolai Volkov. Um, but this is, I believe, the first mention on WWF television of Jesse Ventura's military career, because he references uh, the fact that you know Jesse was also a member of an elite unit just like him he doesn't say uh the navy seals but he says you uh, uh, you an elite unit just like him and you know what were you fighting for when you were when you were there uh words to that effect and there's a pause and jesse's wearing sunglasses but you can tell that he's got a mannerism of oh shit this is breaking kayfabe yeah, he has to break character. Yeah, he has to. He has to break character, and he just says America, and that's all he says. And he and he puts the mic back on Kirshner, and here's my guess on that because I didn't I didn't read anything that was that that explained that, uh, but my guess is the fact is they probably just talked backstage about how they are both military guys, and, and I, I you know I would assume and I've seen this elsewhere when you find two guys who served in the military um you know they they usually start you know there's a bond right away and they start talking and telling stories and, and i assume that was with them and kirshner being as green as he was probably didn't understand and the fact too that it wasn't a lot of kayfabe for him because he this was he was basically playing himself this this ex-military guy so to him he probably didn't think about oh i can't mention that because that's never been incorporated in jesse's character Right. That he was just trying to probably find a way to relate to him on stage as being the, the interviewer. To me, that's an so, honest mistake, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it was just something that he just didn't think about, that, that he thought it would be, be a good thing for him to do. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it wasn't until years and years later that, that Jesse he started talking about that. Pretty much after he had left the business and he got into politics and was doing different things that way. Um, that, 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 that became a part of, of who he was that he talked right. a lot about, about that, that period of his life. So to me, that was, that was a really interesting promo, not only being the most interesting one, that I think the best one that Kirshner did, but also, um, that, that little tense moment there between him and him and Jesse, uh, being, being a very real moment, uh, real moment. But we do know now that Ventura was very proud of course, of his service as a Navy, Navy SEAL. Yeah. And, you know, you can find a bunch of Kirshner's promo work on the network mm -hmm. um you know he was on tuesday night titans or you know and you know a bunch of different things mm -hmm. and you know his promo work was okay to me it wasn't the best it wasn't the worst he has a very gruff voice so i think that you know more often than not he would get his point across but in terms of going off the cuff or elaborating or really digging deep like he probably wasn't there yet mm -hmm. he could have been i think that you know a, a good manager if he was going to stay with the company would have helped him a little bit I, you know at that point i don't know who i would give him but you know the problem was all the managers were heels at that time right you know, exactly were, i mean i think captain lou was working as a face manager at right. the time so maybe maybe him uh you know for before we go on the next segment i should say that even before we were playing to do this 
that I had started to watch the Wrestling Challenge episodes that the network had recently uploaded. Not at the time this recording wasn't too long ago. I think it was the first dozen episodes. And Kirshner's on some of those doing promos and, and, and working matches. So, yeah, I think the only face manager they had at the time was, was Captain yeah, Lou. Yeah. And on those series of matches, he actually winds up leaving. I believe he left to, to go do the, the Super Mario show, maybe. I may be off of my time frame there. But um, he actually has a, 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 a six-man tag uh, with the Bulldogs uh, against uh, the Dream Team and, and uh, Johnny Valiant. And... Uh, winds up winning but that's going to be like his last match ever and he's leaving the wwf and that's when the bulldogs take on uh matilda as their full-time manager right but anyway now i'm going off on a tangent about that but anyway i had already watched some kirshner stuff and that was the first kirshner stuff i'd ever seen was the, was the wrestling challenge stuff and, and i would just say on that uh because i know we're going to go into to his to his matches now well let's go into his matches and and and, and we'll see Right. So, yeah, let's talk about some of his notable matches here. And uh, we, we already mentioned WrestleMania 2. That is, you know, certainly his shining moment mm-hmm. as a talent against Nikolai Volkov. He would win that match. Um, and, it, you know, he was bleeding in that match as well. Uh, I assume it was the hard way, but I, I don't <laughs> know for sure. Uh, I would guess. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of his matches on on the network. So, you know, he has, he has a lot of content there that people can look at if they really want to. Some of the ones that, that I watched, uh, I watched a match with the Honky Tonk Man that was on primetime wrestling. He had a notable loss in a pretty big tournament at the time called the Wrestling Classic Tournament, mm-hmm. where he faced Adrian Adonis, and he, he would lose that one. Um, there's, there's a hilarious match with iron mike sharp who was a notable jobber and the commentary in this match is really great i think at at one at one point they uh talk about you know i I think it's lord alfred hayes or or maybe it's bobby heenan it really doesn't matter but somebody says you know i go there's only one iron mike sharp and gorilla says thank god you know (laughs) so it's it's in this it has the weirdest finish this match where Kirshner wins by hitting Mike Sharp with his own forearm. Yeah, I watched that. Yeah, and I guess you're led to believe that he, you know Mike Sharp put something in there, but it is the weirdest finish ever. Mm-hmm. And I have to say, my my favorite match of his would be one that he had with uh, King Harley Race. Uh, there's a couple matches on there. There's one at the Boston Garden, which has more headbutts in it than any match you'll ever see and there's a lot of trash thrown in the ring but to me harley race made him look really really good in the ring as only a veteran like that could do um so if i was listing my favorite match of his it would definitely be that there's you know kirshner like had a lot of feuds with foreigners because of him being an american hero right. so volkoff and iron Sheik. you know you, you there's a lot of content on there with them um but uh but yeah i mean he and it took me a while and i don't know about you but it took me a while to realize what his finisher was because when he would win he would mostly win with like a you know it'd be like a quick roll up or you know like a sudden thing here or there it wasn't until like way into my research that i heard gorilla say the parachute drop which is basically just a samoan drop um you know now it's written on IMDb that he also had a Cobra clutch as a finish, but one of his finishers in WWF was called a parachute drop. But those are the matches that I had written down, Leonard. Which ones did you look at? Well, I did watch the, the, the Iron Mark Shark match. Uh, and I distinctly remember the loaded, uh, cause that was the thing. He wore this wrist gauntlet. Yeah. And the deal was that he would, he would load it, that he would take something and put in it, or sometimes it was already in it and he would like cap it like the guy that would pound the toe of the boot to load it. And, but he never hit it. He would always miss it. But I think that might've been the only time where I saw him take the arm and hit, you know, hit him with it. It was, it was a neat finish. I did not watch the Boston guard match. Um, I'm going to have to go find that one. I would love, I'd love to see a good Kirshner match. 
against the one the ones I were watching were the very quick ones. I did see the one with Honky Tonk Man. Um, I was watching a lot of the, the a lot of the short ones because um, the ones where he was winning were were very short, and then even the ones where he kind of was was losing later on were also not very long. Um, again, his most uh, distinct matches were probably those against uh, the Sheik and and uh, Nikolai Volkov and. I watched a, or I should say, I listened to a uh, shoot interview with him, yeah. uh, and and on that he did say about how, like it, he didn't have to do a lot of work for those because they had instant heat. You know, me against right. a foreigner, instant heat. Don't have to do a whole lot. So of everything I watched, the stuff with Sheik and Volkov commonly probably stands out the most. The WrestleMania two match probably stands out the most. But again, and I don't mean this to knock him specifically, but I don't really remember a whole lot of what I watched now. You know, I kind of forgot the shark match until you mentioned it. Right. Uh, because a lot of them are very much the same. I don't think I ever saw one where he did the parachute drop. And again, I didn't know what it was, I didn't know he had a finisher. You know, not everyone had a finisher back in the day. Right. So and I just kind of thought he was this, a dude that didn't The, have a the only reason I knew what his finisher was is because I kept watching matches until – I heard somebody refer to it and I was like, I, I was like, this guy's got to have a finisher. I, you know, and it was a match against somebody named Johnny K9. And oh yeah, I know Jan. I know Johnny K9. Yeah. So he was managed by slick. And I guess like in the, in the match, he was supposed to face Butch Reed, but Butch Reed was out with the flu. So slick brought down Johnny K9 and Johnny K9 lost to with, to the parachute drop. And, uh, also, at this time, you can see Kirshner developing a, a prominent beard, you know, uh, you know, kind of getting rid of the five o'clock shadow look. But, you know, in terms of his in-ring style, it, it was very straightforward. You know, there were times when. He yeah, played, it was very much. He, I was just going to say he's pretty much an old school kind of power wrestler. Yeah. And like it, it, if he was working against people that were would give to him as well, that's when you could really see some of the other talent that he had. Um, but most of the time it would be punches or a drop kick, you know, but with, like I said, the Harley race match, like, you know, they had chemistry to me anyway. Um, now it's not five stars certainly, but it, it was decent. And, uh, he had one against Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff that I watched that was okay. And, uh, the last one that I watched, uh, right before we started recording, this was against, uh, Don Morocco, um, who also had a beard in that match, which I did not you know, remember him having one, but, uh, yeah. So he had matches with, that would have been people. around the wrestling challenge time. Yeah. He had matches with a lot of different people. He tagged with a bunch of different people. He, you know, he looks fondly upon his time in WWF. He was able to work with Bruno San Martino and, uh, Ricky steamboat and people like this. Uh, he's very positive about his time in, mm -hmm. in WWF. Uh, so, any other matches before we move on here, Leonard? Uh, no, not not really. Uh, again, like, like I said, uh, there wasn't a whole lot that really stuck out to me, although I'm going to go back now and, and find that Harley Race match. Um, so, But there are two matches I watched of his post-spotlight years to talk about. So, yeah. we'll get there. So, let's, uh, let's get into that. Let's get into some of his post-spotlight years. And... Uh, his post spotlight years were other than what I already mentioned with him going to Canada, he went, go to uh, new Japan pro wrestling for some short stints there in 89 and 90. And then that kind of started a successful career for him in Japan. And, you know, one of the things I read was that the schedule with WWF was really tough. And back then they would sometimes do two, three shows a day. And, you know, that's not easy for somebody to get into and get used to, I should say. And in the shoot interview that apparently Leonard and I both uh, listened to, mm -hmm. he, he talks about how you, it's very easy to get into that partying mode where, you know, you're, you're snorting Coke and you're taking painkillers and drinking. And it's a, a very vicious cycle that you couldn't get into. So with the Japanese, the reason I mentioned that is the Japan tours that he would do, he would go there for a couple of weeks and then he would come back home for a few weeks. And that's kind of how he did it. So it was a little bit more manageable. And so he didn't want to bring his Ameri American Patriot character to Japan. So he 
decided since he was a film buff and he liked horror movies and they really liked horror characters in Japan, he would become Leatherface, uh, modeled obviously after the victim, uh, vi villain of the same name in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So while he was there, he would wrestle with uh, International Wrestling Association of Japan and eventually FMW, which is Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling. And he would uh, be in death matches, basically. And they, uh, you know, are very, po were very popular, I should say. Now everything's online, but they were very popular among the tape trading community back in the day, Leonard. And I'm sure you heard about them when you were younger, as, as did I. Right. Um, mainly I heard about it because of Cactus Jack and Terry Funk, uh, not necessarily Leatherface, but, um, I have a feeling you and I watched one of the same matches from this stint. And I, I'll just say there is a match that I found with, it's a tag match with it's Leatherface one and Leatherface two against two Japanese talent. And it is called a nail hell death match. And I have to say, it it has to be seen to be believed there. And I'm, when I say there's nails in this match, I don't mean like little itty bitty short nails. These are like huge carpenter nails that are like, you know, and hundreds of them stuck into a board. And it is brutal, brutal to watch like... And, you know, these guys, Leatherfaces, they come down to the ring and they chase the audience around with chainsaws. And then they start whipping these guys into beds of nails and barbed wire boards. And it, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's crazy stuff. Unfortunately, the footage of these matches is really grainy and not good at all. But uh, it's still brutal all the same. Did you watch that one? Yeah, that was uh, against Shoji Nakamaki and Hiroshi Ono, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thank you. I made. From December of 1994, right. and um, yeah, you know, I thought it was it was a really it was a really fun match. Again, yeah, it's very brutal, but the very beginning they come out, and I and I didn't make note of who the second leather face was, but I guess Rick, the idea. Rick Patterson that, is his name. Rick Patterson, thank you. That I guess that uh, Kirshner was was off for a time. Well, he was. We might get to this. He was he was in prison, uh, in Japan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, just very yeah. So briefly, yeah, talk about that, and we'll come back. Very, very briefly, um, mm -hmm. he was, I guess, you know, the nightlife there in in Japan. He would um, go out to this area, this district of Japan known as Rapongi, and he got into an altercation with a Japanese guy who kept harassing him and one of his friends. And, you know, Kirshner's 250 pounds and he hit this guy in the jaw. And as it's written in the WWE.com article, literally broke his face. <laughs> so when I say that, uh, and Bruce Pritchard has also said this in, uh, you know, some of the clips of his, his podcast, Mike Kirshner was not somebody you wanted to F with. Like, I mean, he was a legit tough guy and you might, look at him next to somebody like Don Morocco and think, oh, well, you know, look at Morocco. He's huge. Kirshner is the real deal. And like so, some of the matches he went through in Japan, uh, it's just, you know, it's just crazy uh, to me. But yes, he would end up spending six months in a Japanese prison for assaulting this guy. Um, you know, anytime you're spending, you know, time in a foreign prison, that is, that is some, tough shit to go through right Leonard you, you done messed up yeah. <laughs> yeah you've got to get but but anyway when he was there that's when they brought in the other guy and then when Kirshner returned they made him a tag team known as the leather faces and I think it was after that point to distinguish himself he also was known as super leather uh but but anyway that yeah that nail hell match is is something that you gotta watch and then the other one I wound up watching I just kind of I I put in YouTube first two that popped up I watched that was one and the other was from 2007 uh against Raven and it was actually uh his first match since 2002 he had went into retirement and came back uh as super leather 
this was a real sloppy hardcore match. I can't say a whole lot about it. There was a lot of stalling and running around and not a lot of action. At one point, the commentator, one of the commentators even say, and I don't know who it is, I don't know why they're beating up buckets and chairs and not each other because they were like smashing the stuff, but not smashing it on each other. Uh, so that was not probably a great match to watch of, of, of that gimmick. But overall, of the little things that I watched, I, I think I like the super leather gimmick more than I like Corporal Kirshner. I think he really cut loose in the character. Of course, he's yeah. more of a veteran at this point. It's a different style, certainly. Uh, but, but um, you know, when we do these uh, spotlight series, I'm often uh, amazed by what happens after because I usually yeah. don't know where these guys went after. Right. Uh, you know, like with Mantar, he had this whole great career in Europe that I didn't know about. And here with Kirshner, he had this whole great career in Japan, uh, being a very legendary character over there. And I did know that in Japan, that there were several guys who had done the horror movie gimmicks. And there was a Michael Myers guy and a Freddy Krueger guy and a Jason guy and all this. Uh, and a Leatherface guy, but I did not know the Leatherface was Kirshner. So, um, again, this is one of the guys where you might say that his post-spotlight years are probably better than his actual spotlight years. And from right. the things and I've certainly, read, and certainly money-wise it was. And that we should add, that's yeah. one of the reasons why guys would go over there, is that the money was really good. And, uh, you mm -hmm. know, and probably better if you are participating in these death matches which only certain people would be willing to do. Uh, mm -hmm. He also had some really vicious bouts with Terry Funk, um, which which are worth seeing out if, if you like that sort of thing. And I should mention about the Nail Hell match, that that match was even too hardcore for the company that he was in. So it resulted in him, you know, having to leave that company for FMW, uh, where, as Leonard said, he would become... Uh, super super leather <laughs> which is mm -hmm. which is which is just a great it's like super shredder that's what i think of right um yeah yeah i like that yeah. but uh he retired in 1999 and two years later he was actually advertised for the uh, gimmick battle royal that was at uh wrestlemania what was that x uh x7 yeah WrestleMania yeah, 17, X7. which they were calling X7. Yeah, the yeah. gimmick battle royal. Come on, it's, it's and I guess you, you got to call it X7, Leonard. You can't call it 17. That's yes. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yes, he was. They only did it for that. what two years? It was X. It was X7 and X8. Yeah, okay. yeah, and then it went back to the Roman numerals. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was advertised for that. In eventually, he never showed up, or not that he didn't show up. I don't want to say that, but. Uh, uh, I guess he was advertised, and then they weren't able to work out a deal with him, so he did not appear at, at that event. But uh, nowadays, he is a uh, remarried. He's a grandpa, and he is a truck driver. And he, from everything I've read and listened to, he looks fondly upon his time a as a wrestler and, uh, you know, still seems like he'd be a pretty legit badass based on what i've seen but uh now another thing to mention here before we go out is the fact that in 2006 wwe announced that he was dead yes yes i'm glad you mentioned that i yeah I that, that was in my notes and i almost forgot to mention it yeah that i forget the name of of, of the guy who died but it was someone in the baltimore area and apparently it was never a name that that kirshner ever used it was never anybody he knew or was affiliated with and he can't figure out why they thought it was him. Uh, in the interview, I heard one that I read, um, I guess his mother had contacted WWE and told them that he was alive. Another side note here is I guess his mother wrote a book that was a fictional account of his career of, of somehow. I'd see. I did not um, know that. Yes, that's mentioned in a couple of things I read, and I was confused as about what it was. It seemed like he had made some notes or kept a diary, and then she just kind of filled in with her imagination. And and this, and I don't remember the name of the book. I didn't make another name of the book, but she had written a book. But anyway, she was the one that contacted WB and said that that's not him. He's alive. And apparently, they just took it down and didn't say anything. 
Right. And he, so didn't, he no, didn't call into them either. <laughs> no, he didn't. He didn't care. But there's no knowledge of where that came from. Here's my guess. My guess is this, is that this guy told people he was Corporal Kirshner. Yeah. And because you've heard that. And I've heard Jim Cornette tell stories about people. Like there was a fake Stan Lane that <laughs> that died and that his wife, that he was listed as Stan Lane because his wife thought he was Stan Lane because he told, yeah, I used to be Stan Lane. Uh, so I'm thinking that this guy had told people he was Corporal Kirshner. So when he died, that probably got in no bit or something. And somebody half saw it on the, at, you know, at WWE and right. they ran it. That would be my best guess. Um, and even in the one interview, you know, he is still friends with Nikolai Volkov. Nikolai Volkov lives in that area. I was actually at a uh, movie convention slash autograph show in Delaware that Volkov was at. Right. Um, so I know he lives in that area because he probably he only do things like in that area. But right. Um, but he, he was like, he doesn't live here. He lives in Florida now. Like that's not, you know, like even Volkov knew that wasn't him. So that was very interesting, but that was where the interview that I read and the in the shoot interview that I listened to came from was from 06 because he had all these people reaching out to him saying, hey, what's going on? Right. And then saying, hey, do you want to talk? And and, and that seems to be kind of the last stuff, I, um, you know, he did was, was from that time period. But it's very interesting to figure out, like, where where did that come from? Yeah, and, and again, yeah. my best guess is that this dude said he was said he was. Good. Yeah, and I mean, death hoaxes has happened from time to time, whether it's wrestlers mm-hmm. or regular or other celebrities. You know, it, yeah. it's, sometimes it's, it's the same name, like someone with the same name dies, right. and somebody sees it, and but this wasn't even close to the same name. No, it wasn't. Yeah, that, it was. It's very confusing. But uh, you know, I think that this guy's legacy is probably going to be more so of his stint in Japan. You know, yeah. and, you know, the fact that he does have that LJN figure will always endear him with uh, people who grew up in the 80s as wrestling fans. And I have to say, you know, just kind of fantasy book in here. How great would it have been to see him in WWF during the Attitude Era? Like as maybe a version of this Leatherface gimmick or like maybe even revamp the Colonel, the Corporal Kirshner gimmick and make him like hardcore. Like, you know even if he was only in some of the hardcore matches with people like boss man and Al snow, I would have watched the hell out of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, in the attitude era, he probably would have been a heel because he was a raw, raw American soldier. Right. True. With, with the way they were doing things, you, you know, through throughout most of, the, of, of this show, uh, you know, I haven't said, I would say a lot of positive things. Cause I don't think he was very memorable during his WWF stint. Uh, but I think he had a lot of potential. I think he had a high ceiling because he was super green. I mean, he, he was, he yeah. was only a pro like, like a, like a year, maybe, right. maybe a year and a half, um, you know, fresh out of wrestling school to working for WWF as a job or to getting this character. Uh, but, you know, everything that I watch, I would say he had shining moments. He seemed to get better as he went. Mm-hmm. And the Leatherface gimmick seemed really cool. The way he the way he played it, um, and and the way it was, and I and I agree with you. I think if he would have came back, what would have been really cool would be if he came back during the Attitude Era and he did both. <laughs> yeah, because because you could wear the the Leatherface, you know, clothes and and the mask it could be anybody underneath there. So he could have he could have done both. Uh, maybe maybe do the Royal Rumble like fully did, where he he's in as both characters. Oh, man, I no. think that would have been a neat, neat gimmick for him to do. But anyway, I really enjoyed getting to know him as a character and as a wrestler. Me too. Yeah. And I, I think you're. Yeah. yeah, and I think you're right that his lasting legacy to our generation is going to be that LJN figure. Uh, that that that's it. And in the one interview I heard, he did talk about that. He called it a living doll. That you know, this this it's a doll, but it's of a living person. It's of him. And right. how neat that was that he had his own action figure and he would see kids playing with it. And I'm sure that would be a rush for anybody that you have your own action figure and and uh, it's it's of you and, and, and kids have it. And so, uh, yeah, you know, I always enjoy doing these spotlights. I think I get to know people better even than, than I knew them before. And uh, with, with Kirshner, 
even though that WWF stint, I don't think was great. I think it showed the potential he had. Mm -hmm. And I'd be very interested in watching some more of the, of the Japanese stuff. I'm not a huge hardcore fan. I got to be in the mood for it. Right. Uh, but I'd be interested in watching some more of the Japanese stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. Like, it's obvious that they had to go with this military gimmick. But at the same time, you know, it seems like uh, everybody was all these, these companies were always searching for their Sarge and Slaughter. <laughs> whether it be yeah. Ranger Ross or, and it didn't have to be even in the same era. Like, I mean, you always had these military characters and I, you know, they had to have been trying to attain the same level of notoriety that Sergeant Slaughter had. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, none of these guys were able to do it to, to the, to that level anyway. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. It was really fun to talk about Corporal Kirshner uh, we can look at the LJN figure in a different way from now on. It's uh, not just a doll that you had to buy at Toys R Us because it was the only one left on the shelf. Now we know that uh, there was a big career behind that figure, right? So for Leonard, my name is Chad, and we will see you next time. Please look at my other show, Daily to Downloads. Comment, let us know your Corporal Kirshner memories, if you have any, or Leatherface memories. And uh, we will see you next time.